Thank you. Yeah. All right, so to introduce myself, my name is Suzanne Dergacheva. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Evolving Web, Drupal shop up in Montreal. Um, and I lead our Drupal practice. I also get to be the uh, initially initiative lead of Promote Drupal. So if you're interested in helping um, market Drupal, you know, contributing to Drupal.org and making more exciting uh, marketing materials around the Drupal project, I would love to chat with you about that. Um, and in terms of what we're going to talk about today, um, yeah, I want to talk about user experience discovery and all the decision making that goes into a new project. Um, so I'm sure many of you have worked on projects that have a discovery phase and discovery can mean so many different things to, to different people. Um, sometimes projects are really driven by technology. So in discovery, we're always just talking about, you know, what kind of upgrade do we have to do? Do, do we have to, uh, do, are we doing this project because we have to upgrade to Drupal 9? Um, sometimes discovery is really driven by a specific pain point, um, maybe just by the fact that people seem to not be able to find content. Uh, sometimes it's driven by a, a rebrand. Um, there's all kinds of different things that can drive, drive uh, projects, and that often influences what we do in discovery and what discovery even means. Um, so there's a lot of kind of scope that we have to think about. Um, and just to define like what, what discovery leads into, it usually leads into some kind of strategy, and then at some point we do design work and we actually start creating and building new things. Um, and I know a lot of us who are, have more of a technical development background, we really like this idea of agile, like, oh, I don't want to estimate everything, let's just do it all agile. We'll figure it out as we go along. Um, and so I think it's important in discovery to remember that it's always less expensive to do things before you start building them. Um, and so there is a great opportunity in discovery to, to do that, to, to kind of figure out what's the direction, how are we scoping this project, and what problems are we actually trying to solve. Um, and Annika, who's a UX designer who I work with, I think talks about discovery in a really nice way. She talks about it being this this first phase that involves just figuring out what are all the problems to be solved, kind of figuring out what questions we should be asking um, and what direction we should, go, we should go next. And sometimes it feels like it's a process that's never done, but I think it's done when we realize we can start building. So uh, once, as UX designers, once we get around to actually proposing solutions and saying, yeah, we really think this is our educated guess of what this should be like, we want to start usability testing. This is usually something we start to do when discovery is quote unquote finished. But discovery itself can also be this iterative process. And I think this is really interesting thing to think about. Um, you might have been stuck in a, in a workshop at some point or in some meeting where people say, oh, well, we really think the website should do this. Um, but our users say that, and the data says this, and we have no idea what to do. It all seems to speak to different things. Um, maybe you work with an SEO analytics person. Does anyone have someone like that that they work with? And they always come in and say, oh, we should do more lead generation. Like, let's do keyword research and figure out how to get new people on the site. Um, and then you have somebody off running user research, and they say, actually, all of our users just say that uh, they want, they want a big search form on the, the front page. <laughs> and then the stakeholders say, well, I want my content to be on the front page instead. And it's just really hard sometimes to make traction and figure out what to do next. Um, so instead, I like to think of these different pieces, these different ways of collecting input. You know, you have data, you have your stakeholder input, and then you have the research that you might be doing. And we can think of these as all being kind of iterative steps. Um, and each one kind of points to the questions to ask uh, at the next step. So I'm going to walk us through this today. Um, and I'm going to start where we typically start at the beginning of a project, which is with stakeholder input. And stakeholder input is really pointing us to, to the goals and the questions to ask. Um, stakeholder input is really great for things like 
you know, asking users, uh, asking, um, asking what uh, questions we want the data to answer, asking what kind of questions we want to find out from users, um, and figuring out how to prioritize those goals. So stakeholders tend to be good at prioritizing things um, if they're doing their job. <laughs> um, and uh, often that can kind of help us direct what to go next. Um, sometimes those stakeholders make a lot of assumptions about uh, what users need. And, um, and, and they can tell us about uh, new, new types of users that we might want to reach. Um, so we can kind of we can kind of get some ideas, but we often have a hard time kind of moving forward on, on what to implement. A stakeholder workshop is kind of a classic way to start working with, with uh, people, getting different uh, perspectives around the table. So if you're building a website and you have you know, people from different branches, different departments, they might not have ever really talked to each other about what, is, what their website does, what the goals are. Um, and so part of the role of discovery is to kind of get these people to, to talk to each other, just get them into the same room. And you might run a workshop and feel like, oh, we put all this effort in, we got 20 people around the table and nobody agreed about anything. But sometimes just getting those people to listen to each other is, um, is part of the process. I also really think it's important to bring in other people into those workshops and we might traditionally think of as stakeholders. So you might think of like the stakeholder as like the boss, right? Like uh, the head of the department who uh, runs the strategy or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an admissions website you're building and it's the recruitment, um, the, head of, the head of recruitment who we're trying to serve and that's the big stakeholder. But it's also really valuable to bring in these other voices, like people who are actually creating content, uh, people who are gonna be using this website or this application that we're building, getting them into the room just to allow their voices to be heard. And anywhere between five and 20 people can be, can be a part of a successful work, work, workshop. Whereas I would suggest if you do have on the higher side of that 20 people that you might need to set up uh, some breakout rooms if you're doing this on Zoom just to make sure that really the voices are heard. So in order for a really good discovery to happen, um, you really want to start weaving in the user perspective early. So even before you're doing what you call user research, you want those user voices to be heard. And part of that is all about education. Um, it's about getting people to see that there are other perspectives that can influence the outcome of the project um, and that if you have assumptions, it might not, this project might not just be there to validate your assumptions, but actually to reject some of them. And so you have to get people kind of open to that idea that, oh, we might not actually end up where you think we're going to. You can kind of rally people around a project goal, but not really around a project uh, uh, strategy at this point. You don't have a strategy yet. You're just trying to to figure out like what is the what is the scope and what kind of questions do we want to ask. And a couple things that can make this type of discovery useful that I would really suggest. Um, if you're asking people for input, you want to do user journey mapping at this point, or you want to just um, get people on the same page about the target audiences. Um, it's, a, it's a really good idea to have a facilitator who's there who's acting kind of as an impartial person. So I like to sometimes attend and be a facilitator, um, but sometimes my role is, is uh, or in the past, my role has been more as the UX person. So what does that mean in a workshop context? So uh, if you're running a workshop, let's say you're trying to decide like the, the, the project goal is like complete restructuring of this website. Okay, so everything's on the table. We, we might come up with a totally new set of content that we want to build on this new project. Um, and so someone needs to be there kind of playing the UX hat, having already looked at all the content on this website and knowing 
at least as much about what's there as the, uh, as the other people in the, the meeting. But it's also nice to have a facilitator who's playing more of an outsider role, who can kind of see things with fresh eyes. And that person can be there to um, make sure everybody contributes, connect with the group, and actually summarize what's said. And it's nice to have somebody with fresh eyes doing that because you can act more as a user advocate. Another really important aspect is getting stakeholder input in such, um, in such a context as a workshop is that some people like to and are used to dominating the conversation. Um, and I recognize that sometimes that person is me. You know, I kind of like to come in, I have my ideas, I like to say, oh, this is how I think things should be and I want to tell you all about it. Um, but in a workshop context, some people tend to be uh, shy and they want to hear what everyone else says first or they're scared of maybe um, saying the wrong thing in front of their boss um, maybe they are a subject matter expert, but they're used to working more in a context where they're giving their input through a, a document, maybe asynchronously. And so when you're running such a workshop, it's really important to be cognizant of that, to know who the people are in the room and who might have a good perspective on different things you're, you're talking about. So if you're coming up with this new vision for the, the content and you're trying to generate new ideas, you might realize, like, oh, this person in the room, they know a lot about, um, they know a lot about these educational resources on this website. They know these PDFs that we're trying to convert to web content better than anyone. So let's ask them um, specifically about what's there and what they think, uh, what they think the solution is. Um, yeah, and, uh, and in this context, getting representative users is great. You also often have to draw these people out as well and, and uh, ask them specifically, invite them to speak, and, uh, and get that, that kind of perspective brought into the conversation. So the stakeholder input is going to give you um, some idea of where where you want to go, what the scope is, like who, what kind of users you kind of want to target. Um, and then at some point you also want to start looking at data. You know, these days we think data should be driving a lot of decisions. We think that uh, if we're tracking what people do on websites, that should really tell us what the ideal user experience should be. And it's kind of this, um, it's kind of this, this dream that we like to, you know, like to uh, invent, I, which I don't think is 100% true. I think that data definitely plays a role in this picture, um, but the, the downside of, of data is that it can only really point you to the behavior that users are doing in your current website. So let's say you have a website and you know Okay, we've heard from users that they think content is hard to find, um, but let's look at the data to see how they're currently behaving. And we see that they are going to page A, but they're not going to page B. So you might conclude, oh, everyone's going to page A, that must be way more important than page B. But maybe they're just not finding it because page B is just you know, not as present in the, in the menu, maybe the label is incorrect. Maybe it's not indexed properly in the search. There could be tons of reasons why they're not going to page B. Um, so it's really hard to draw conclusions, especially when the analytics you're tracking is, is limited. If you, don't, if you don't have a specific segmentation or funnel set up, if you're just looking at um, a pretty basic set of, of data, um, it can be really hard to reach any conclusion. Um, so your data is really only good as the tracking that you have set up now, and if you don't have specific events that you're tracking, it can be extremely hard. Um, and it can also be hard to, to analyze uh, analytics if you're working in a context where your goal is to inform people. So maybe some of you have this situation, you're, you're running a site, you have all kinds of content, and you just really want to make that content available to people, and that's, that's your main goal. 
Um, so if you are informing your users, how do you even measure success? Is it you know, people spending longer on the site because your site is extremely informative? Uh, or do, does the fact that they spend a long time on the site mean that they're not finding what they're looking for? Do you want more page views because people find the information useful so they go from page to page? Or do you want fewer because you think, oh, if there's fewer page views, that means people find what they want right away. Um, so without really clear goals, um, analytics can be hard to use uh, at all. Um, and so maybe, maybe in your design and your implementation, you actually want to consider this and say, our data right now is useless. It's not telling us at all if our site is informative. How do we build in some kind of interaction so that we can measure that better? Um, some things that data can be really useful for is identifying some, some outliers in your current content. <clears throat> Um, you might have a lot of assumptions about how your site is currently used, your stakeholders might as well, and, the, and the, the, the analytics on your site can kind of point to maybe some, some interesting surprises. Um, so for example, you might have um, some content that gets a lot of use that you is all, off way over in some corner of the website. Nobody mentioned it in your stakeholder workshop that you ran. Um, no one's talking about this content, and yet maybe you find that 20% of new visitors to the site actually end up on that page. Um, or maybe you find that there's a lot of direct traffic because people have found this content really useful. You know, maybe it's a PDF that you created years ago, forgot about, and everyone's bookmarked it. Um, so you can kind of identify content that gets this amount of traffic that maybe didn't come up when you ran a site audit or didn't come up in a workshop. Um, and at the same time, you can identify other content that um, gets very little use, but that all the stakeholders think is really important. And maybe you can flag that and ask questions about it. So uh, often you'll end up you know, doing a, a quick scan and maybe at this point, you know, if you don't have a lot of tracking set up, it might be just uh, very cursory. Um, but you can do a quick scan of, of your data and that can raise some questions that you try and answer with user research. Um, okay. So that, that leads us to the next uh, topic, which is qualitative, qu oh, sorry, quantitative user research. Is that where we're at yet? Yes, quantitative user research. So I, I talk about two types of user research, two kind of main categories. So quantitative user research is where, actually, where we're actually trying to get some numbers. We have very specific questions we want to ask, and we're maybe trying to make a decision between two options, or we're trying to see if a label actually speaks to users. Um, so it's kind of like data, but instead of just interpreting it from a set of you know, Google Analytics results, we're actually trying to get the data by talking to real users. So to get that information in a quantitative way, we can do things like set up user surveys, um, surveys with fixed questions like multiple choice or or kind of true false, things like that. Um, we can set up first click testing to kind of see like where do people first click when you ask them to do a specific task um, in a kind of usability testing format. And you can do tree testing. But remember I said at the beginning that discovery usually happens before you start building and designing things. So if you're doing this type of user research, um, don't underestimate the value of testing what you have. You might assume that what you have doesn't work because maybe it needs a redesign uh, or a rebrand, like visually it's out of date, um, but there might be parts of it that are working well. So you can always start by testing what you have. 
Um, you can also give people surveys when they exit a site. If you have motivated enough users, they might participate. And um, if you actually have a more internal audience, like a community that you've built, people tend to be more likely to participate in surveys like this. You can also send it out if you have audiences that are truly internal, like you're building a, a website and one of the audiences is the, the staff or you know, students at a university. You might actually have email addresses you can send out surveys to. Um, so a qualified set of feedback on the current state is useful, but any test you can also run on a competitor's site. So sometimes, you know, you, you do a workshop and everybody says, oh, our site is horrible, but everybody loves this other site. Oh yeah, let's just rebuild what they have. Um, so you can always do some testing on um, what other people are doing to see, does that actually offer a better user experience? So a few, um, a few details of this. Uh, sur so surveys can be useful. I know um, sometimes we start a project and there's surveys that have already been done. Uh, sometimes they're not asking quite the same questions I would ask. I think it's, it's really useful to get some, some input first about the goals of a website before you start running a, a survey, because the survey is kind of a chance to see what the user's perspective is on those specific goals. Um, uh, sometimes you can validate pain points or needs, um, and often the thing that's missing from um, what you know about users is actually what, what is the user trying to accomplish or how do they differentiate this organization from that one. And these are really basic things. Like you'd think that it would be kind of obvious, oh, this user is trying to apply to this university because they're going to an admissions website. But maybe they have some other intermediary goals that we haven't thought of, you know? Um, maybe uh, they're actually trying to They've already decided to apply to the university and they're just trying to figure out, should I go to program A or program B? So there might be some other nuances that we haven't considered that we can get access to through this type of research. Um, so surveys can help you really figure out these persona kind of questions. Um, you know, we always kind of depend on personas for design work, for marketing work. Um, and unless you're actually getting user research, you can only make assumptions and create proto-personas, but user research allows you to dig in more and, and make your personas a lot more robust. Um, and then the other type of, of research you can do that's more quantitative is this type of tree testing or findability testing. Um, and if you've never, has anyone here run a tree test before? It's kind of the, one of the easiest tests to run. Um, so what you might do is just take your current site map. Imagine you're, you're thinking, I want to reorganize my site map. I don't think it's working well right now. Uh, you take that site map. You ask users, go through this site map and find information about, let's say, scholarships. So they come to the site map. Um, they're only going to see the menu structure, they don't see any content, they don't see a real user interface, and they just click through that menu structure and you see if they go to the right page. That's it, and you see what percentage of users reach their goal. So um, it can really help you just evaluate if a navigation solution is actually working. Um, and there's similar types of tests that you can run, like kind of variations of this for things like um, search or label, labels of, of different types of content. Now, much more time consuming, but also very valuable, probably the ideal, is to also do some qualitative user research before you begin your project. Um, and again, you, you might already have information about your users that you don't need to do this type of of work. You might already have a whole set of research you can start with, um, but if you don't, then it's really useful to add that to your discovery process. Um, and I find that this qual kind of qualitative 
research gives us a much better opportunity than the quantitative research at asking opportunities about the future state. Like what, what, are, what, what ideas can we pull in from actual users about what this interface, what this website, what this application should actually do or be. Um, and it can really help us see how the user would prioritize things. Um, so qualitative user research, this can take many different forms. We can do user interviews. We can uh, do competitive usability testing, so I'll talk more about that. Um, Open-ended survey questions, so again, it could be that you do quantitative and qualitative research at the same time uh, in the same survey, but the qualitative questions that are more open-ended will take some more time to go through and uh, parse and figure out what they mean to kind of translate into something actionable. Um, and so it's an opportunity to ask users, like, what would you like this to do? Or, um, or why, like why, why would you go come to this website or why did you just do the thing that you did? Um, and so it allows us to integrate a lot more ideas and kind of be a bit more challenged in our thinking. So while we start off by talking to the insiders, the stakeholders in the group, talking to users should kind of expand a bit our thinking. Um, and I think qualitative Research is an op also an opportunity to admit that you don't understand your audiences fully and to, to try to show the stakeholders that. Maybe people will think, oh yeah, we know exactly what our users are looking for. They just need us to, to do this and to present the information this way. Um, qualitative research can kind of demonstrate otherwise. So a few examples. So user interviews are can be, can be pretty efficient. You can do 15 minute interviews where you're just asking a couple questions. It's really important to plan those questions well. And that's why I suggest doing the other activities first, making sure you've taken a look at the data, talked to stakeholders, maybe done some quantitative research in advance, and then see, okay, for, based on all that, we wanna know, um, you know, this new piece of content that we're thinking of proposing, is this actually going to be useful for people? Or if we have this page that really talks about the benefits of this organization, does that actually speak to users? Is that actually what is going to convince them? So you can, you can always throw out new ideas and also ask open-ended questions that are going to lead to, to new things. Um, Interviews don't have to take a lot of time. What tends to take more time is recruitment, analyzing the results, that kind of thing. You can always um, record these things, but don't underestimate the fact that you have to sit there and take notes and actually turn this into something useful at the end of the day. Um, and then I think another type of testing that's qualitative that people don't consider, it's testing the current state. So. When you're looking at analytics and you see that somebody visited five pages and then left the site, you don't really know is five pages a lot, a little, do we want them to spend more time or less time? It's kind of hard to interpret that information. But qualitative research, when you're actually sitting there with the user, you can ask them, oh, you went to these five pages before you, you know, found the link to apply to a scholarship. Why did you do that? And like, what were you thinking? And was, was that useful to go to those five pages? Um, so it can give us really a lot more insight into, into that story. Um, and it can even tell this, help you tell the story of those analytics. Of course, it's, it's impossible to know for sure what every user is thinking, um, but it can kind of help you with that interpretation if you speak to a few people. Um, and then finally, and this is kind of something I think people are maybe hesitant to do sometimes, but you can also do usability testing of your competitors. So let's say there are those two other websites that everybody says that they love, like, oh, why don't we just do it like this other university does it? They got it all figured out. Um, but you might 
have a hard time actually pinpointing like, what do they do well? Do we just like their brand? Do they just have one good video that sells their school and that's it, that's why we like it? Or is it actually good user experience? You know, is, is it that their content is well organized? Or is it actually the layout of the page or the menu? You know, what is it that really makes this something that we want to emulate? Um, and so competitive testing, actually asking users to do a task using a competitor's website, watching them doing that and asking them why they did this or, or what they like, um, this can be a very powerful tool. And you don't have to do extensive testing. You can ask you know, three people to, to do this task. Um, so this is something that you can do. And again, it's something that you're doing without building anything. You're taking advantage of stuff that already exists. So at some point in this process, you, you are going to do some persona creation. This tends to be a really uh, a re real important focal point of the UX process. I think sometimes people put, a, like, people put too much stake into personas. <laughs> And they think, oh, we have to just have the best personas and make them so detailed. Um, keep in mind that personas are really just a tool to um, help get everybody on the same page. It's really more of a communications tool to summarize your work than actually like the, the, the output that you should be depending on for project success. Like, you, you want your personas there to help answer questions about, you know, what do people want to do on the website? Um, and then when you're writing your content, are we also speaking to these people? When you're doing marketing campaigns, are we also speaking to the, the personas? Um, so keep in mind that they should be this communications tool that you're using for the whole team. Um, and as part of the whole f fact that discovery is a bit iterative, um, that can be one way to communicate back then to the stakeholders back at the beginning of the cycle um, okay, we did this, this research, we found that users were trying to do these things. Um, this is what users think is important and a priority. And let's make sure we're on the same page about that before we decide on the strategy and, and where we should invest. Um, and this is all part of challenging assumptions about user needs because whatever personas you end up with, um, actually what you communicate are the priorities of those users, that's, that's really the important part. Um, and again, this is iterative because it's, it's an educational process. You're kind of getting input from these different sources, then you're bringing it back to stakeholders. And then again, stakeholders might have some reaction to this, which can help lead into um, figuring out what data you want to collect. Like, okay, this is our strategy. These are what our users want. So now going forward with this new version of our website, what kind of data do we want to collect so that we know how to better make decisions in the future? And then what kind of user research do we want to plan after we build the site that will help us make even more improvements? So even though discovery might take you know, four weeks, it's in the calendar and then you, you call it done, um, we can still think of it as being a bit agile and iterative in that you can keep the cycle going. Um, and of course, if you're using Drupal and you have uh, enough flexibility in how you build the site, you should have the ability to make improvements after launch and to keep this going. Um, and that goes for data collection, you know, figuring out are these landing pages working? Do we need to adjust them? Should we change our content? All of those things. So, I think that's all of the content that I had prepared. I also just wanted to give a quick shout out. Um, uh, our team at Evolving Web does a lot of Drupal trainings. So if you're curious to learn more Drupal, get more kind of hands-on into development or content strategy or SEO or accessibility after this camp, um, we have lots of courses coming up in the coming months and a whole like full education track starting in September. So please let me know if you want to chat more about that. Um, and I would love to hear your questions or comments about the presentation.
Yeah. Um, you sort of answered this, but I just kind of was wondering if you have like a, a more narrow piece of advice for me, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, when you have like the quantitative and qualitative data from users, and the quantitative data, the numbers really skew in one direction towards needs, right? Like if there's like an overwhelming <coughs> metric around mm -hmm. needs, but then the qualitative data points are like equitably counterintuitive. How do you prioritize the need? Because I think it's true, like I, it's 100% mm -hmm. sure that the numbers don't tell you the whole story. Oh yeah. So if the narrative is telling you two different things that are represented equally in the qualitative, how do you then prioritize those needs? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. So if if you presented kind of two options, like oh. Maybe we want to make, um, like kind of going again to a higher, I think I'm thinking higher ed because we're at the university. Um, and let's say like we're imagining a site map where you have programs as a top level menu item and then you have admissions and people, when they want to apply to a program, where do they go? Do they go to programs for admissions? So maybe you're just doing some quantitative usability testing to see which one do they click on when you say go apply to a program. Um, and so you might find, oh, everybody clicks on programs because maybe in your question you use the word program. <laughs> you want to apply a program, they're just thinking program and that's what they click. Um, if you're doing then some qualitative testing and you get a deeper picture and you find out by asking people, well, when you're considering a university, you know, are, do you usually go out and research a bunch of universities first? and decide which ones, or are you more thinking already in your mind, um, I want to attend this particular program, and you just want to know where you can go to that. So you're comparing more like program pages. Maybe that's going to give you a little bit more in-depth information about how to position these things and how the user's looking for the information. But yeah, sometimes it's confusing, and then you end up thinking, oh, should we put this link in two places? And then that, that can lead to problems as well. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, hard problem. Other ideas? That, so do you have any um, surveys, existing surveys that you use that has good results? Oh, like standardized kind of surveys? Like That's templates a, or something? Yeah, I do have a template that um, I can share with you if you want. I can give you my, my card. I would say though that it's really better to, to um, it's really better to try to customize a bit the, the yeah. survey each time. I know it's tempting. I've been asking this question for 10 yeah, years. Yeah, so. we start a project and we're like, oh, just send them the survey. We have a survey. And it kind of asks like some typical things like, well, who are the, t like a stakeholder survey, like who are the target audiences? And then like, what content do you think is most important? And just kind of runs through a set of questions. But I think if you at least have a template to start with, then when you're looking at a new project and you, you say like, okay, well, I know what the I know what the they're going to answer. So mm -hmm. let's not ask them that. Let's instead say, um, okay, well, obviously this is a recruitment website. Your audience is students, but what type of students are typically coming? And are you trying right now to recruit more this type or that type? So try to make the questions a little bit more specific, so that the answers you get are a little bit more um, uh, pithy and like you can get to the hard problems faster. Hmm? So, so your diagram showed uh, um, an iterative cycle with decision makers going to data, going to quantitative research, going to qualitative research, going back to... It, is that really the cycle or could you have drawn the arrows any which way? I, yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think, what I'm, I think that putting it in this framework helps me kind of see what the relationship between these things is. But realistically, in any project, you're, you're not, you know, you're not going to do everything in the same order. So um, in one project, like doing data before doing research might just mean, okay, let's glance at the analytics to make sure we know kind of what's going on. 
For another project, that might be much more in depth, and you might do it after because you just don't have time. Or um, on some projects, you might already have a lot of research, like results. So I, there's nothing I hate more than being asked the same questions again and again. And so I think actually the most important thing in discovery is starting out by looking at like, what do we already know before we ask any questions? So if all this research has already been done, then of course you're gonna look at that first before you do the other things because why wouldn't you kind of see what answers you already have to your questions? So yeah, I don't think it has to be like this, but I think, um, I think sometimes uh, the stakeholder information kind of gets, stakeholders think that their, part, their piece is the biggest piece. So sometimes it can help to just kind of know where it actually fits in. And I've never like presented this to a client in a project. It's always just like, what's happening behind the scenes when I'm trying to figure stuff out. Um, any other thoughts or questions? If anyone, I didn't do, like, I, I didn't spend as much time on my slides as I would like, and I was thinking it'd be great to have a list of tools and things like this. So if you have any questions about that, like what are some useful um, tools to use for testing, feel free to email me um, or come up and chat with me about it because I think it's always useful to kind of share tips and tricks on that front as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I hope that you all have success with the discovery you're doing or that you're doing in the future on projects and uh, hope that this, this was helpful to help you just think about the problems. Uh, thank you. Well, would you consider the question asked? Sorry? Would you consider the question asked about tools? <laughs> we have a bread now, you can go on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think I'm going to get some water first and then, <laughs> yeah.